thank uh, Diane, of course, for, for sharing her story with us. Uh, a lot of you guys uh, remember Diane as a student. She came from, from York. Uh, she was a four-year student and graduated in 08. When, when she was at Mercersburg, she was uh, involved with the soccer program. She played percussion in the band. Uh, she spent through the German club or German uh, class. She was able to travel to Austria and Germany and uh, was a photographer for the school newspaper and a prefect in, uh, in Tippetts. Uh, after Mercersburg, she went to Bucknell, where she graduated with a BS in biochemistry and cell biology and modern in German. Uh, following graduation, she spent time in Delaware doing research in molecular biology, uh, working mostly on vaccine development uh, as a research assistant. That she enjoyed that work, but she really missed working with, with people. And she went and received uh, another bachelor's degree in nursing from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, since 2016, she's uh, she worked at she first worked as an acute re rehab nurse uh, at West Penn Hospital, and currently she's uh, working in the critical care ICU at West Penn Hospital. Uh, she also <clears throat> finished her master's degree in nursing education. And she does some work as a clinical instructor for Mercy Hospital School of Nursing. She's soon gonna leave uh, Pittsburgh, uh, where she's gonna go to Bronx, New York, and serve as their COVID crisis team. Uh, this this program, uh, the We Speak program, came about as a celebration of 50 years of co-education at Mercersburg. And Diane's the opening We Speak uh, series. This series was developed to help create discussions around gender equity in today's society. Today, she's gonna to be talking specifically about bias and inequality toward the LGBTQ community in healthcare. And uh, so thanks, Diane, for, for taking the risk and, and sharing your story. Uh, I just got a text from someone else who'll be joining us, so I think people will be kind of coming in. Uh, these situations kind of work best if you mute your microphone to stop outside noise. You can use the chat window and I'll help feed questions to Diane if she's not able to see them. But again, uh, you know, I'm sure Diane would like this to be. I just lost sound. I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know. Oh, what I yeah. Oh, did he mute himself? Oh, I see. okay, okay. Um, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, thank you for that great introduction, uh, Jason. Um, I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak to you guys, and um, you know, whoever joins, um, it'll be um, more of a discussion rather than I'm not trying to lecture to anyone. Um, please try to you know ask questions. Um, we can you know, we're going to cover kind of a range of topics tonight. And it's it's pretty broad. Um, and just, you know, it's kind of skim the surface of a lot of things. So um, I'm also not claiming to be, you know, an expert on anything. So just, um, you know, I can give my professional opinion and my personal experiences and, um, and we'll go from there. But um, hey, Eli. Um, I just want to, you know, re reiterate um, thanking everyone for the opportunity. Um, this like interaction has made me think about um, the changes that have happened in terms of like technology, even since I graduated from um, Mercersburg, which doesn't feel like that long ago. Um, but you know, the fact that we can all interact in this group setting is really, you know, a testament to technology and how it's changing and how, you know, COVID-19 is separating us, but we're very much together. So I think that's pretty amazing. So um, yeah, let's have a dialogue and a discussion um, and, you know, focused on the bias and inequalities of LGBTQ individuals um, in healthcare specifically. Um, and uh, I just want to first kind of get into this by um, presenting you guys with th 
three scenarios. Um, and we'll go over some terms and everything afterwards, but um, I'll read through the scenarios uh, one at a time and just um, kind of listen and uh, mold them over and see how, how they make you feel, what they make you think about. Um, and we'll kind of go from there and they'll be the foundation for what we're talking about tonight. So, uh, okay. Every can, one can hear me okay? Okay. So I'll read through the first scenario. Historically, you have had poor experiences with most healthcare providers, including your PCP. You have never felt comfortable talking with them. They have made you feel overlooked or misunderstood. You have never been able to talk about your sexual orientation. Sorry, before. With them because it never fit into any of the boxes on their intake form. They never asked and you never elaborated. As a result, you limited your exposure to them by only seeking medical care only when absolutely necessary. Scenario one. So moving on to scenario two. You're a physician in an emergency department. You have been working in medicine for over 30 years. An 18 year old was just admitted with bruises and a bloody nose. The name on their driver's license is Jason, yet the name they give you is Janae. Janae reports that her preferred pronouns are she, her. The nurse is uncertain how to address this, pa this patient. Janae reports getting kicked out of her house because she recently told her parents that she hasn't felt comfortable in her own body for some time now and would rather be addressed as Jason. All right, scenario three. You grew up in rural Montana. Every Sunday while growing up, you go to church. At some point, you learned about the golden rule to love all people and to treat them as equal. But on another Sunday, you learned about sin and temp temptation and that man should not lie with man. You, have your sm you leave your small town and life goes on. Years pass and you fall in love with someone that happens to be the same sex as you. You feel shame and fear, but you also feel loved and honest and understood. After hiding it for years, you decide to come out to your family, fearing the worst, but hoping for the best. The majority of your family takes it relatively well, but your father takes it harder than anyone and chooses to never talk to you again. So, you know, I shared these scenarios with someone else recently and they said, wow, that's really depressing. And they're really not meant to be depressing. They're meant to be, you know, realistic scenarios um, that really bring home these issues because any of these scenarios can happen and do happen in every single um, you know, physician office and in every single ED and every single hospital across the country. Um, and it's, it, they touch on a number of issues um, concerning uh, inequalities and um, bias in healthcare towards LGBTQ individuals. Um, so um, just think about those scenarios as we move through um, and if you have any sort of comments on them or questions just let me know. Uh, so it might be useful to sort of go over some general definitions um, in terms of defining the LGBTQ community and um, obviously it's a series of acronyms that stand for a number of different things. Um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, it, it, you know, uh, and the most difficult part about it is probably that, you know, we, we constantly try to categorize individuals and there's not always an acronym for what everyone identifies as. And, um, and so as a result, um, not all individuals feel 
heard or seen or um, just present in general. Uh, and that can, you know, lead to just feeling um, not cared for, not willing to like express themselves. Um, it can be, it's a major issue in terms of um, like intake forms at doctor's offices. Um, so often they give you, you know, we're so, I think the majority of society is still um, set on that, you know, binary understanding of male versus female or, um, you know, single versus married and a simple change to those intake forms can make a huge difference in terms of visibility for those people and those patients. And um, it creates a dialogue. And with that dialogue, you can start to understand their needs. And so if they never get that opportunity to provide that information, they might not feel comfortable having that conversation period. And so they go to the doctor's office, they go to the hospital, information is an exchange, they don't get the proper um, care that they may need or deserve, and they might not come back for a while because they have that fear and that negative experience. So, um, yeah, I think the, the point is there's no, it's hard to define this community because there's no single definition that, that encompasses everyone. Um, it's, it's a diverse and multi-dimensional group of people. And, um, but usually, and unfortunately the commonality that they all have is that they're often stigmatized um, because of their either sexual orientation or gender identity and or gender expression. So um, I also want to kind of point out the importance of um, intersectionality that kind of looks at the, the multidimensional facets of each individual that you might not necessarily fall just into one category. And um, it looks at, you know, multiple identities within one person and how, um, you know, one person can have multiple marginalized identities and that it kind of it connects to the fact that you know there's inequalities that exist for these individuals in this community but not all of these inequalities are are equal um you know a, a african-american trans woman is going to experience different inequalities than um a, a, a white trans person so it it's it's looking at each person and their collective identities to what they to what they really need and recognizing that they aren't all the same so and if anyone needs clarification on any of these terms please let me know we can we can go further into it um but i just want to give you some national statistics and these are from 2015 so obviously you know take that as for what it is um per the national health interview survey um in 2015 2.8 percent of the u.s population aged 18 and over identify as either lesbian gay or bisexual um and this equates to roughly 5.5 million individuals and and actually a recent Gallup poll um, slightly after that um, found that it could be as high as 4.1%. So, you know, close to 10 million individuals. So this group encom encompasses a lot of people. And in terms of, um, you know, youth within the high school setting, um, a study found that um, in 2015, 8% of high school students identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. So, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of individuals, and I feel sometimes 
people lose perspective because they may not know someone personally, or they may think they don't know, but it's, um, these individuals are in every state. Um, they're not equally distributed everywhere. Um, and that gets into the, a discussion too of, you know, rural versus urban environments and, um, you know, going along with the statistics, I think South Dakota has like 2% and then, you know, Washington DC 8.6% identify as, you know, being part of the LGBTQ community. So, um, and that has a lot to do with social demographics, feeling comfortable with being out, feeling safe enough to be out and we have to think about the health the disparities that exist in those different environments as well. You know, in um, in rural South Dakota, you're not going you're not going to have the um, healthcare facilities. Period. That you are in an urban city setting, um, and, and that's and you're not going to have that social network. And and those are huge factors in physical and mental health. So, and I just wanna say that, um, let's see, we're gonna move on to kind of talking about those scenarios that we mentioned earlier and talking about the um, factors that, the different issues that they address. So I know some people joined after I kind of read through them, um, but the first scenario, I'll just re uh, review, focused on, um, you know, you're, you might not, you might be someone that uh, doesn't identify as the normal uh, binary, um, might not have a binary, you know, sexual identity or gender identity, and you go to the doctor's office and you don't feel comfortable bringing those those things up about yourself and they're not um no one asks you personal questions about it um and this could be for a number of reasons um it kind of brings up the idea of creating you know as medical professionals we have to create an environment that is welcoming to all types of people and we have to make them feel visible and seen, but we also have to be uh, knowledgeable and educated. And it's been found that, you know, within medical school, and med medical schools, four years, they spend five hours total focused on um, LGBT education. Um, in all of medical school. And that's a, it's a major problem. And um, so they don't feel prepared. They may feel awkward. Um, individuals that have been practicing medicine for a long time, you know, the definitions of these um, terms are changing. They might have no idea that what information they're lacking. And so, it's um, a responsibility for healthcare professionals. And this goes beyond like doctors and nurses, which are getting a lot of, you know, praise right now, but it's therapists, it's um, the secretaries, it's everyone that interacts with these um, individuals. And as professionals, we need to recognize that that's a shortcoming of the, of the education system and of our employers. I work for, personally, I can tell you, I work for a fairly large hospital in Pittsburgh. Um, we have 300 some beds. I work in an ICU and, you know, we have the normal training that's diversity and inclusion, but it's very, it's not very comprehensive. Um, you know, we, we are told as nurses too that, you know, we, we care for all individuals, um, but we don't get a lot of education on different types of people, I would say, um, unless we seek that, 
that out ourselves. It's not, it's not provided by uh, the employer necessarily. So, and that's, I think that's something that we should, you know, be more um, outspoken about and demand sometimes. Um, and it, it goes for, you know, whether you're a student and you decide to study medicine or study public policy or public health, like these things should be included in your education. And it's, it does you a disservice and um, those individuals a disservice if it's not included. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, it's just um, one of those things that we have to recognize and through education, we will feel more comfortable. And as a result, um, those individuals feel more comfortable and seen. Um, so that's, you know, that was one aspect of that first scenario. Um, the other is just, um, oh yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself, hold on. Yeah, so I just wanna emphasize knowing, um, it's, it's even knowing basic terms terminology for those those individuals like knowing that um you know sexual sexuality and gender um and knowing the difference between those two um i think they're used you know pretty interchangeably and it, they're, and they're not the same thing um you know biological sex is different than sexual identity is different than gender is different than gender identity and um you know, when we think about biological sex, we're thinking about physical characteristics versus sexual identity, where it describes who you're, you know, emotionally, physically, romantically attracted to versus uh, gender, I, uh, gender identity, whereas it's how you physically feel about um, the, um, what you associate with and how you feel and that doesn't necessarily mean your it that correlates with your physical sexual traits and then it goes beyond that to gender expression and how you how you choose to present yourself to you know everyone else the clothes you wear the hairstyle you wear this is all it's all been seen very much um as a as a binary um and recognizing that all of these things exist more so on a spectrum is really important. Um, that we've seen, you know, through uh, biological research and science that it's not just X, X and X, Y chromosomes. It, the hormone levels are not the same for everyone. Um, it's not everyone falls into a male versus female. And then it go, you go one step further and not everyone identifies as a woman or a man. And then not everyone wants to express themselves um, as feminine versus masculine. Everyone is different um, on, a, on this spectrum. So uh, let's see just recognizing that as part of, as part of that. Um, uh, do I have a question? Sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering if you ever, when you're teaching, refer to the genderbred person. You've seen that visual? I have not. Let me, I'm gonna try to share content because it is, it's a super helpful visual that we use when we're teaching the, our, Docs and residents. So can everybody see that now? Does that work? It's a little small, but. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to do it on my phone, but if you Google it, the, um, oh yeah, it talks exactly about what you're describing that yeah. providing a visual way to look at gender identity versus expression versus biological sex versus sexual and romantic attraction. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. I'm, you know, thinking about sexual, um, biological sexes, like your, you know, some people even bring it down to like what's between your legs. And I don't necessarily just like, um, 
and then like your gender identity is what's in your in your mind and then your um your like sexual attraction is like what's in your heart um but yeah i think that i think that visual is very helpful actually um yeah so knowing those terms and it can be confusing um and again people use them interchangeably and and we don't always get that baseline just those that simple um that quick overview of those of those different terms can be really helpful um, in making people feel um, more comfortable overall. Uh, so let's kind of, we'll go on to the second scenario um, that focused on an individual, an 18 year old who, um, who went to the emergency department and um, now identifies as um, Janae, who has um, Jason on her driver's license. And um, this is, you know, you have a physician that has been working for many years and um, a, uh, a nurse that, you know, doesn't necessarily feel comfortable addressing this patient. And it's, these are situations that happen. Um, I can tell you, I've, you know, cared for um, transgender individuals, and I've seen nurses, you know, miss um, misgender patients or feel, you know, visibly feel uncomfortable um, when caring for them. And I don't believe um, it's a lack of um, respect for anyone. I think it comes down to a lack of exposure and a lack of knowledge on their behalf. And, um, and I think it can be, and it can be really difficult for, especially for the patients that we see, because we will get patients that are, you know, intubated and sedated and they can't necessarily advocate for themselves. And, um, and they might not have family members that, um, really do a good job of advocating for them as well, or are even present really. So um, it, it can, it, this is a situation that is, you know, not, is, is very common and um, whether someone decides to, you know, seek, um, if you seek hormone therapy or, you know, um, surgical, um, surgical treatment, uh, it, it doesn't change um, how you identify. Um, so that's one of the issues that's brought up in um, the second scenario. And it, it, it's part of acknowledging, and, and it talks about, you know, an 18 year old who's been um, kicked out of their house and physically, um, abused and um, because they are, decide to be honest with their family. And so it's just the second scenario brings up the issue of acknowledging um, the risks that um, LGBTQ youth are um, and adults and elderly individuals are at risk for um, including stigmatization, um, discrimination, uh, increased risk of violence, um, you know, rejection by families and whole communities. And, um, it's a huge thing for, um, the, the younger individuals that, you know, can end up homeless. Um, 40% of homeless youth in the U S identify as, um, LGBTQ. So it's, it's, um, and it can be difficult for, um, for them to even seek uh, assistance or any resources um, because, of, um, because of the situation they're placed in. And, um, and that leads to, you know, it can impact their health by being homeless, by seeking, um, by being at an increased risk for substance abuse, for, um, 
uh, you know, suicide ideations and, and um, it's, it's uh, a, a major problem. And they're also at risk for, you know, violence at school and, and bullying and issues like that. Um, and then in terms of risks for adults, there's still, um, you know, major inequalities in the workplace and specifically in terms of health insurance coverage and um, denial of care or just a lack of a, a, a subpar care um, as we've kind of um, kind of talked about a little bit already and and then for the elderly it's still it's still an issue I mean many um, older LGBTQ individuals feel very isolated or they may not have um, they may not have children so they they're very they Again, it's, they might feel separate from their family or um, rejected, or um, there are issues still, you know, even, even though um, we've passed like same-sex marriage, um, there's still individuals that can't visit their, their partners in hospitals because they don't have um, the, legal rights to and um, and if they are not you know a legal spouse and if the families um, are the decision makers and they don't agree with um, the partner they can limit their access to that their significant other and it's it happens and um, as a healthcare provider, you can't you can't just give their information out to anyone on this, um, even in those situations. Um, so, I think we've made a lot of strides, um, but we still have um, a long way to go for many reasons. And um, uh, even though we've made some changes in terms of uh, some political changes and, um, you know, in regards to legal uh, rights, we still have to continuously move to increase them and, and not roll back any of those um, progresses that have been made. Um, so I want to talk about, um, we talked about the risks that, you know, these individuals, um, have and and specifically health challenges um, including um, I mentioned substance abuse earlier um, sexual physical violence um, HIV AIDS um, mental illness including uh, depression and anxiety uh, early onset of certain disabilities and then you know, higher likelihood for developing chronic conditions such as uh, cardiovascular disease and obesity. Um, and these can be uh, compounded by uh, a, either a lack of care or um, an avoidance of care at some point at, um, in some situations. Uh, because of negative experiences in the past um, or just a lack of availability and resources. And um, so, and then in the third scenario um, that I presented, it talks about a person who, um, and this really hits uh, home for me more so um, because rural Montana can easily be rural Pennsylvania or really rural anywhere and um, and that individual you know it, it really struggles with their identity based on these the social um, factors that they've grown up in and the social environments and um, 
it's again really important to talk about those that social support for for these individuals um, because it might not be family um, it might not be friends it's it's creating that social network for them um, and so we we have to talk about like I mentioned earlier rural versus urban and the the resources that are available in those settings, um, religious factors that play a role, um, political factors on the local, state, and national levels, and and that social support. So, um, who is who is there for those individuals, um, and um, who can create that safe environment. And um, these, these issues can create uh, long-term impacts on mental and physical health. So um, it can be a lifelong challenge. I, I can say um, we have to remember that um, for someone to be honest and open, either with a care provider or as a friend or a family member, you know, coming out and, and feeling comfortable with their identity is a constant process. It's not something you do once, it's something you choose to do over and over again. And depending on the day or the situation, they might not choose to um, come out to someone on any given day because of how they, the environment that they're placed in and how they're made to feel. So, um, and again, if it, the health healthcare provider is knowledgeable and um, and you know available and willing to help, they might not be able to if they don't have all of the information about that in, individual. They can't provide the right recommendations or care plan. Um, if they don't, if that individual doesn't share that with them. Okay, so let's talk about things that we can do to make a difference. Um, so I talked about, you know, we're here to discuss these issues and um, to educate ourselves um, either as, you know, I, as a healthcare professional um, and anyone else that is, should demand that um, their institution or workplace um, or even their community um, be an advocate or an ally. Um, and I really, it, encourage people that if someone lacks knowledge to share knowledge with them um, that we shouldn't be um, that most people like I said with my coworkers that that one time um, they don't lack respect for anyone um, they just lack knowledge and so it sometimes it just takes um, knowing someone that is either you know close to them or that they work with or that that can can kind of give them that that information that they need to and and to respect that individual um, and I think we need to recognize um, it's been found for you know medical professionals have everyone has bias but it's recognizing that explicit and implicit bias that not that bias that we know we possess uh, versus that bias that's almost on a subconscious level and working to identify those biases and to and to work to you know um, correct them um, and to to work work towards that kind of um, understanding others through understanding yourself. Um, 
and everyone needs to work on that. And then, um, you know, if you're a student or you're, you're going in, or anyone really, if you're going into research or public health or public policy or politics, I think we need to work to um, include, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, in addition to, you know, race and ethnicity into demographic surveys. So we can truly understand, you know, the presence that everyone has and the different identities that exist. Um, I think they've, you know, they've done a good job of incorporating race and ethnicity, but historically, um, gender and, well, gender identity and sexual identity have gone, um, have been looked over um, and, or neglected, I should say. And, and, you know, you can't, I think that's one of the reasons that there has been a lack of, you know, maybe education in various institutions because there's not a lot of research to, to utilize. And so we need, in order to change um, the education system, we need to change um, the uh, research that's being done for this community. And, um, you know, for family members and friends of the LGBTQ community, which is, you know, probably everyone, um, you just have to show your support for these indiv individuals. Um, this is not about you or how you feel, even if you're still trying to understand um, everything yourself. This is a life journey for that individual. Um, rather than seeing it as a change in their character, view it, as, view it more as them sharing this new aspect of themselves with you. Um, and you really have a choice to make. Um, you can positively or negatively impact um, their health and life experience. So, you know, everyone plays a role in this. It's not just, you know, healthcare professionals and um, the in individuals that are experience, experiencing that themselves. It's, it's everyone. So, um, and then, you know, to the members of the LGBTQ community, I think it's important to remember to um, be patient and be understanding. Um, I think we need to remind ourselves that the only thing that is constant is that things will change and things will get better um, through, you know, societal changes. Um, people be, are feeling safer and more comfortable with coming out. And as a result, you know, the, the individual numbers are increasing. And it's not that they weren't there before. It's just that they now are, are visible. And, and, that's, and that's good, but we still have a long way to go. Um, <clears throat> and uh, resources, there's so many resources available. Um, if things get really bad, you know, call a family member, friend, you can call me, reach out. It's, there are so many resources and um, organizations that are out there to, um, you know, provide as much support as possible. Um, and then I think it's important um, that as a member of the LGBT community, you have to educate yourself as well and, you know, find a provider and health facility that has your best interest in mind. Um, I thought it was strange working for the, and I'll wrap up here soon, um, you know, working for the, um, the system, the healthcare system that I do currently, that they had a whole um, web page dedicated to finding a doctor that was uh, inclusive. And I, my initial thought was, why does this even exist? Like everyone should be inclusive. Um, but, you know, if you're going to have doctors that aren't knowledgeable, or don't care to be knowledgeable, then you should at least have a resource for people to find people that are. 
And so, you know, initially I, I was kind of distraught about it and have come around to the idea that, you know, in the interim between now and having everyone um, be educated and prepared and understanding that at least we can have the resources to find those individuals. Um, and that we should all expect um, better from individuals that make you feel unheard and unseen. And we should just, you know, expect better from everyone. And, and then in just for everyone in general, this is like my little soapbox, I think we should care about the issues that matter to us and that affect um, maybe not yourself, but your loved ones. Um, and we shouldn't get complacent at at any time really about um, change and, and in politics and we shouldn't accept, accept the status quo. And, um, and, you know, I just want to come back to the fact that this is, you know, COVID has remind us, rem reminded us that we are very much a, a global community um, and that we're really truly all in this together. So that's all I have to say. Hi, Dan, I, I've got a quick question. Well, maybe not that quick, but yeah. I was thinking a, a couple of weeks ago, actually, in the New York Times Magazine, the kind of ethicist question, there was a doctor who wrote in, uh, this was a doctor who transitioned, and uh, they were asking if, if they had any obligation to tell their patients that they, that they were, that they had transitioned. And, and uh, you, you know, out of full disclosure, if they want to have a, a relationship of trust and, and, you know, that, which is obviously important in a doctor patient. And, you know, I think that as, uh, as the world becomes more open to those types of things, I think it also opens itself up to asking those types of questions and, and trying to create that dialogue. And, and, you know, you said that it's not talked about in, med schools or training and stuff like that. But I think that those type of discussions need to be talked about. Like, is there any obligation for a doctor to let their patients know? And, and then do the patients have a right to, to say that, uh, that they're not comfortable with that, uh, that person as their doctor? You, you know, uh, yeah. have you heard any of those types of conversations or that type of dialogue before or uh, in your training or experience? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, honestly, I, I do think those um, conversations should be open. And I don't think anyone should be made to feel uncomfortable. And, um, you know, if, if someone truly doesn't want that patient to be their doctor, um, they have the right to find another doctor. Um, I don't think that should elicit that conversation should elicit any sort of you know negative response from anyone um but again it is their choice to make um do you think the doctor should be required to to tell that to um, i don't know what the answer is you know I, yeah, I'm, I'm truly i i i think you know like i it's it's uh, an aspect of yourself that you can choose to share. Um, I think, I mean, me personally, I think it's more so if it comes up in conversation, um, it's, I can tell you that, you know, I identify as a, a cisgender female that's, I identifies as, as, as gay or lesbian, but I don't, bring it up as the forefront of my conversation and I don't put it on my resume. It's just, you know, uh, an information about myself. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I, and I don't usually share that information with my patients at all either. Um, because it doesn't impact their care. Um, but you know, if I did, I'm sure some of them would feel uncomfortable about it. Um, so I don't think it should be required. Um, but again, if there's um, some sort of like search engine or whatnot where you say, 
you know, you, you give that information, um, you provide that information, then if someone has access to that and they feel uncomfortable, then they can seek other care. I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is in that situation. Anyone else have any questions? Just have sort of two two comments, and um, one of them. Thank you for your uh, bringing up the intake form um, mm -hmm. because that's something that I think everyone can do something about when they read an intake form, and, and it doesn't reflect what it should. You can then take go to that hospital provider and say, you know, your form doesn't re represent very well, right. and so. I, as their patient, you have every right to do that and to help them understand why that's not representative. So I think right. that's just a takeaway for me. Of uh, I've, I've certainly recognized that and maybe th thought about it in passing, but maybe we'll think more deeply about it the next time I, I do one of those forms. Uh, and the second one is I, I have found it really fascinating in Pennsylvania Dr. Rachel Levine, who is transgender, and I think right. very obviously a very public figure right now. Um, and I, I wonder how that will sway people's confidence in a provider being uh, a good fit for you based on being a good fit for you, not necessarily of other characteristics. So um, I, f I found watching her fascinating because she is um, so knowledgeable and, and just, uh, I, it makes me wonder, she's been so public, how mm -hmm. that will make people's comfort level and, and exposure to that maybe change biases. So just more of a, of, a, of a statement than anything on that. Yeah, I think that's, I, in the past, you know, couple years, I, de I definitely think we've seen um, more visibility for the entire community, whether it's in you know, health healthcare, um, or or politics rather, um, or you know, um, movies or um, just uh, I can't even think of the word. Um, just people being uh, outspoken and and representative of the greater community, and I think it's it's good. It's it's really good. Um, I think people will still struggle. Um, I actually, you know, I get floated all over the hospital now because our census is kind of low. It's kind of a weird situation for us. But um, as a result, I've had to, you know, interact with some people in the hospital um, that I don't normally interact with, one being like one of our transporters. And she just happened to come up in conversation and he said, well, I don't really know how to feel about her. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> and he's, he said, well, I don't really know, like, if I agree with, you know, what she's chosen to do. And I'm like, okay, but, but that's, you know, if, if someone truly feels, you know, uncomfortable with themselves, um, you know, she, she's, she made that choice. Uh, or not choice, I'm sorry. Um, she identified with something that wasn't um, explicitly, you know, the, the gender that she was given at birth. And, um, and so it creates this dialogue and, he, you know, he didn't, he kind of didn't really agree. We didn't agree or disagree. We were just having this conversation and, and having those public figures um, uh, creates that creates that dialogue. And I, I think it's really good um, to, for all individuals to get that, that exposure, because they might ha not have that personal connection that we kind of touched on earlier. But yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think it's good. And um, I think it goes along with, you know, people feeling um, more comfortable with being out and um, and in the and in the public public eye more so, which is great. Hey, Diane, it's Molly. Can you hear me? Okay. 
Yeah, what's up? Hey, um, I just had a question in terms of like COVID-19, um, you know, we've seen a lot of research on different demographics that have been hit uh, maybe harder um, or whether it's like race or ethnicity. Have mm -hmm. you seen any research done about um, the LGBTQ community and how um, if they've been hit, a, you know, harder um, because maybe they're nervous to get the treatment that they need um, because mm -hmm. they would be discriminated against or, um, you know, different circumstances like that? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually haven't seen anything specific to the LGBTQ community. Um, and, you know, they are at higher risks for developing things such as obesity and some of these like comorbidities that have been found to um, kind of lead to individuals to have those more severe um, uh, critical uh, um, results from COVID. And so, you know, individuals with certain comorbidities are more likely to have um, their hospital stays lead to ICU stays. And, um, but I haven't seen any of that um, directly with the LGBTQ community. So I don't, I don't think so. But again, I think we're still in this stage where not all the information is available. And so I think we're trying to figure out more so how it's impacting us and, you know, trying to kind of nail down those, those comorbidities that is um, making it worse or leads to a, a worse, worsening diagnosis or a longer hospital stay. Um, I think a lot of that information will come out, come out later um, once we've had time to kind of um, assess every, all of the information that we have available related to COVID-19. Um, so not, not as of yet. In my personal experience, it seems to, you know, impact, um, at least I've seen the critical patients more so be male versus female, but I don't even know if that's um, an actual, you know, an actual thing. It's just in my experience, but no other, you know, major, major things. Hi, Diane. It's good to see you again. Um, thanks yeah. so much for doing this. Um, I had a question for something you sort of talked on briefly um, already in the in the question part, but um, for the sort of the, I don't know, find a, an inclusive doctor sort of feature that you spoke about, um, how, uh, I guess sort of like, how is that done? Is it doctors who are sort of reporting themselves and saying that they feel comfortable taking those patients or do they have certain training that they're doing um, or what would qualify them um, as, a, as an inclus inclusive doctor? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. So the, um, the health system that I work for is Allegheny Health Network and which is owned by, you know, Highmark, which is an insurance company, but through Highmark, they have created this um, find a doctor application um, in which doctors who um, specifically uh, want, are willing to and knowledgeable in um, LGBTQ care and health disparities and, um, and knowledgeable about that population pretty much say that they are. And so they can report that to, um, to Highmark and, and, and pretty much it's like a self-identification process. Um, and I don't know if there's specifically like a survey sent out or some sort of thing where they can choose to, or just, you know, respond. Um, but it's, it's pretty comprehensive. And there are also, Additionally, um, you know, different organizations in Pittsburgh spe specifically that are willing to provide, you know, inclusive um, 
in services, um, whether it's to, it's to any sort of um, workplace. And, and that ensures, you know, creating um, a more inclusive environment. And so it's, it's not just for healthcare professionals, it's for all workplace um, uh, groups. So you can, you can definitely, that is a resource that's also available too. And that's not affiliated with, you know, any healthcare system, that's a different entity entirely, so. Thanks again, Diane. Uh, you know, I, I want to, if we can, uh, and I know if you're not able to, that's okay, but, uh, you know, as we try to kind of push out our speaking series, and uh, I'd love to be able to get a picture of every, a screenshot of everyone on, if people can turn their video on, which would let me take a screenshot, um, unless you're, it's not, if you're on your phone or something, but, ah, uh, there you are, Sonia, nice background. Look at the city, you look like you're out. <laughs> no, no, uh, great, hold, hold on one sec here, let me just get this screenshot. I'm screenshotting through. We get one more for good luck. And say cheese, awesome. Uh, you, you know, uh, we're, you know, this is new for us, of course, these kind of virtual engagements. And so, uh, you know, thanks again, Diane, for helping to lead the way. You know, I, I hope you guys visit uh, www.mersburg.edu slash events to kind of read about our programming. On Thursday this week, kind of the second of the We Speak is gonna be Maggie Goff, that was with us earlier, who runs an incubator uh, for entrepreneurs that are, uh, specializing in, in women issues and other underrepresented groups and talking about that work. And so I encourage you guys to register for that one. Uh, then, then we're going to have uh, a virtual book club uh, with current members of the 15. And all these you can uh, register online through that through the school's webpage. Um, hopefully, uh, Steph, we're trying to find a way that Steph and, and uh, her cousin June Marquis can talk about women in STEM. And there, uh, there's lots of great programming already on there, and, and that that program, the calendar is growing. So make sure you visit there again and, and register. But it's a uh, you know tough time everyone's going through, but this is giving us an opportunity to kind of think differently and engage differently. And so I appreciate you guys taking the time. Uh, I'll follow up with Diane's email, uh, which and if you guys have any more questions about that, you can always reach out to her. Yeah. Thanks again, guys. Hopefully I, um, you know, brought up some topics that make you think and, you know, ask questions about and support others and, and just let me know if you have any other questions or um, if you need any other resources or support. All right. Thanks, well, Diane. Thank you. Yeah, thanks guys for coming. <laughs>